let's just start with a little bit about y'all's background growing up and kind of what got you to what you're doing today with Marin Crosby. Great. Okay. I'll take the lead. So Sarah and I are sisters and we grew up on our family's uh, ranch in West Texas. Um, so my dad, our, for generations, our family's been in the cattle business. And um, so that was kind of what was familiar to us. And um, because of our, I guess, probably heritage and our backgrounds, cowboy boots were always very much part of our wardrobe and very much our aesthetic. So fast forward, we went to boarding school in Austin. We actually Although Sarah's eight years my um, junior, we both attended TCU for college. So go Frogs. And then um, I moved to New York right when I graduated school. Sarah did the same years later. Um, But, you know, through kind of like our journey, whether that be college or boarding school, and then later um, in New York when I was uptown in in finance and Sarah was downtown in fashion, we wore our cowboy boots. They were just very much kind of a part of like what we knew. And, uh, And people just had a fantastic reaction to them. And so I guess that's probably how, um, just recognizing the traction that we got from wearing them and, and people's reaction to them and, you know, asking where we had ours designed and, and who built them, which was done by our cousin, Sarah will speak to you and kind of led was the impetus for the business, which Sarah can tell you more about. Yeah. And so our uncle actually owns Rios of Mercedes, which okay. is a very storied cowboy boot manufacturing facility and line um, that's been in existence since the late 1860s. And in my family, since the 1960s. Um, wow. And Rios does nothing direct to consumer, meaning they only make boots. They make Rios and Mercedes boots for wholesalers. So they sell to Cavenders and Boot Barn and Pinto Ranch and all the, all the big guys. And they don't do, again, anything direct to consumer. So you couldn't walk in and order a pair of customs like you, my fellow West Texan, could walk <laughs> into you know Rocket Busters in El Paso or Letty's in Fort Worth and order a pair and have them made for you. But they would make an exception for friends and family. So my sweet and very long-suffering uncle would <laughs> make customs for us and we'd get wild ideas and call him and tell him we had to have TCU boots with Texas flags on the back and hearts on the front and he had to make them for us in three months because I had to wear them <laughs> to the, you know, the football game against AU or whatever. Um, so I think, you know, to that point, we had this access to custom boots, right? And this yeah. this um, access to a, an amazing production facility where pe- are amazing artisans that have been doing it for decades are making a really incredible uh, product by hand. But to Lizzie's point, kind of as we, you know, grew up and moved to New York and our styles and aesthetics kind of changed, so too did our boot designs. And so we would design boots for each other, give them as gifts receive them, you know, from our parents and for big milestones, that kind of thing. And it was really those boots, particularly in the years that we were living in New York, where we just didn't expect people to respond to them. And the way that, you know, we had people just kind of weren't used to to cowboy boots and um, people would stop us on the street all the time and ask us where we'd gotten them. And we just felt like we didn't quite know where to send them again, because they really didn't have access in the city to something custom. Um, And, you know, so much of what's made ready to buy off the rack, especially for women, um, is kind of, you know, wasn't particularly represent, respect, representative of kind of what we were going for or wanted in our wardrobes. So we felt like there was a hole in the market and always, you know, thought that if there's a hole in the market and a niche you can fill, if you can do it the best and be there first, like go after it. And so that was kind of the idea for the business. And I'll piggyback two more things on that. So one is that to Sarah saying that we gave them to each other to kind of mark these milestone events. I mean, these are boots and Sarah handles our production. She can go into the kind of the nitty gritty on how long they take and what all is involved, but they truly are works of art. And because they're heirloom quality, they're really fun to give for these special occasions, whether it be a graduation or, you know, a, a baby or a father's day, a mar- a wedding, um, and so we found that they like marked our lives and held this sentiment of va- sentimental value. And we love the idea of extending that to people as well. And um, I think that that's kind of a rarity. Yeah. Um, and to, you know, it's so, so personal, right? Our, we always say that our, our business is personal and about people. And I'm sure that sounds kind of cheesy, but it's so personal to us. Um, yeah. And also it's so much about people. It's about, you know, the customers that are wearing these boots every day, sacrificing, you know, their hard and earned money to buy them from us. But then also Mark to Lizzie's point, milestoning their lives and, these fun, you know, um, these fun experiences and, and bringing them, you know, home and into their, into their lives well, and their and wardrobes. Well, classic design, and I think that's why people react to them. You know, the, the Western silhouette, the cowboy silhouette is really so all Americana and it's mm-hmm. very kind of like, I think it conjures up just this romance um, in people. And so um, I think it's really fun to kind of 
I think what we're really succeeding at, and I'm so grateful, is making that really relevant in high fashion. I had, when, when we got married, a bunch of my families from the Northeast, like all they wanted to do for that three or four days they were here is buy a pair of boots while they were here. <laughs> that was like, they had to get that checked off. All right, so you guys see this hole in the market. You're in New York. You grew up around the space, clearly a huge part of your life. But a lot of people have ideas and ideas never turn into anything. So uh, an idea without executions and hallucination, y'all didn't hallucinate, you executed. Uh, well, so yeah. like how long did you talk about this? And let's just talk about like those early days. Were you sketching stuff? Like when was it like, all right, we're in? So my husband teases um, Sarah and me. He always, he always says we're kind of like seeds and he has to be careful with the fertilizer because we <laughs> take it and run and like we're doers. Um, I think I think we got we kind of had an aha moment and we both really vividly remember it. We were having brunch one day. It was a Saturday. It was beautiful. It was in the summer. So it was kind of quiet, but we'd gone down to the Union Square Farmer's Market and we were standing on the corner and this really dapper gentleman walked by and just went off on some boots that I was, was wearing. Um, and I just said, Sarah, I know that there's something here. And I think that's when we really kind of got serious about the idea of a business, but it was always something we would do, right? Yeah. I was in really like intense um, job at Goldman Sachs. Sarah <laughs> had graduated from college not all that long ago and taken on a, a big role for her um, with Lafla Randall. Um, and I, I think that we were kind of like, you know, it was something we'd always do. And truly, I think years later, we moved back to Texas. And I guess I kind of have a little bit of an entrepreneurial bent. I wanted to own and run my own business. Um, and when we got back to Texas when Seth and I decided to ha have a family and we moved home. Um, I opened a um, an event decor rental furniture business. Kind of sounds random, but it's a really good business, especially in somewhere like the Metroplex where um, conferences and events, weddings are taken so seriously. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, it was it was fantastic, but it wasn't ever my passion. And so, again, the boot deal just kind of went let go and I sat Sarah down. She, of course, had no time to start law school because there's no time like being in the middle of law school. <laughs> And I said, let's do this. Like, let's let's make it happen. You know, we've torn tears out of magazines for years and gone back to the ranch and been on hikes and talked about the business and had all these fantastic ideas. And she kind of agreed to take it on with me. And um, I guess it was four and a half years ago. Well, we opened. Yeah. And we we really, so it was February of 2016 that we sat down and it was actually Lizzie's birthday. We had maybe a little bit of champagne. <laughs> um, and she was like, you know, let's just send an email. Like we've been talking about this for so long. Let's just send an email and see what this would even kind of look like. And so we sat down and made a list. We laughed. We made a Google tracker like document. You should see it. It's hilarious. It's really fun to go back. Um, and so, But we did. We sent an email to the factory because, you know, got to have boots if you want to sell boots. And yeah. so we we very sweetly emailed my cousin that I mentioned and then our uh, my uncle that I mentioned and our cousins, Jody and Ryan. And said, hey, we want to fly down and see you. We, we have an idea. Um, and they were really gracious and allowed us to, to come see them and to, to pitch this. And then, you know, it, it had such momentum that we always, again, kind of thought it would be something that maybe I did on the side or, you know, maybe it was just a little niche thing and it, it took on a life of its own. And then we opened our brick and mortar and launched well, our collection. Before you get to that point, we also felt strongly about being in Highland Park Village. Yep. We, we just listened to oh, your- Oh, we're going to um, talk about it with well, Ray. Well, we just listened to your, um, your episode with Ray Washburn. And when they agreed to take us on too, I felt like they were kind of betting on us. Um, and I think that they liked the idea. And they, um, so when the factory was on board, when Highland Park Village was on board, we really kind of felt like it was time to- didn't we talk about in the episode, I don't know if he called it, if he actually called y'all out, but he said, there's a new store we just signed up. Was that on the episode or was it off where he said, my wife and my kids have been buying these boots and we just got them to come to Highland Park yeah, Village. Yeah, they've been huge supporters and they're oh, yeah. great. They're a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I'm really yeah. grateful. But Steven um, too, we, uh, we we work with Steven Summers a lot too. Yeah, his, yeah. His partner. Um, so did you actually finish law school or did were you a dropout? I did. No, I finished, finished and took the bar and very gratefully passed it. Yeah. Um so technically I could I could practice, although um, you know, clearly I don't, but I do a little bit for our business and you know, I read our contracts and do that kind of thing. And I'm so grateful for that experience though, Chris. Um, I know that it seems a little desperate to, you know, have done all this, spent so much time and energy and so many hours in the basement of the library, but to not necessarily use it, but I use it every day. And that it, it really taught me how to think, I think a little bit differently in a more dynamic way, um, to ask a lot of questions. And so I'm, I'm so grateful for that education. Um, so our sisters, awesome. you told me before you speak with one brain, what do each of y'all do? How do you complement each other? How do you work together? How do two sisters build a business together? So you know, it's actually quite interesting. 
I think one of the reasons our partnership works so well is we're really, really different. Yeah. So I have a finance background. I was at, at Goldman um, Sachs in New York and then at Tiger Global okay. Hedge Fund. Um, Hell so yeah. I handle the operation side of our business. Um, Sarah has a fashion background, so she really handles the production side. But what's curious is even though I'm much more kind of the logistics the operations person, um, I really do a lot of like the creative like coloring of our boots, which is weird. And then Sarah does like the contract work and that sort of thing, <laughs> which, but she's the creative one. So in a way, there's like this kind of... But okay. but not to say that we don't delineate our roles because yeah. we do. Um, and so to Lizzie's point, like she kind of does operations and then I kind of stick to the nitty gritty of production. And then we, of course, have an amazing team for whom we're so grateful. So they kind of fill in all the gaps. All right. So you made the Google tracker. You kind of wrote down like what's going on. What was on it? Like what was step one for y'all? Like I mean, hilarious, build, build one pair of boots and sell it, like create some line. Like what what was the initial goal? Actually, I'm pretty sure that the first thing on it was uh, our biggest fight was the name. Hilarious. We had the hardest time naming our business. But to answer your question, um, you know, we <laughs> felt really strongly about being a fashion brand. So we yeah. are a fashion brand before we're a cowboy boot brand. Okay. We just happen to make a Western boot. But, you know, we try to approach this like a fashion brand. And so that means, you know, high runway inspiration. That means trips to New York to, you know, meet with amazing people creative designers. So I'm not classically trained, obviously, nor is Lizzie, meaning I can't pattern a boot. So patterning is probably much like an architect, like sketches something out and then puts yeah. it in CAD. You know, we um, sketch something out, but then it has to be laid out by the millimeter. And I'm talking like, you know, stitch gauging from six to seven to eight makes a huge difference. Talking literally a matter of, you know, tiny, tiny millimeters. Um, and it all has to be laid out perfectly because then that is what artisans use to truly, you know, cut each piece of leather and then sew it together, yada, yada. I can't do that. Um, and so we went to New York and felt like one of the first things we should do was work with a truly, you know, classically trained high fashion designer um, that would not only pattern for us because we really do drive a ton of the inspiration and, you know, have ideas and make mid boards and kind of start talking from there. Um, but somebody that would weigh in and be like, oh, but you know what I just saw on the runway and last week when I was at the Milan shows, this is trending for spring. I really think we should bring this element in, that kind of thing. So we really started looking at it. Um, from a fashion standpoint rather than, um, then does that make sense? We started with the fashion. Yep. So you said we're going to build a fashion company. Well, and so you will understand this. Of course, my brain is in the business side of it. And I'm thinking we'll build a fashion company. We'll scale it. We have access to a factory and to production that other people don't. We yep. have a really authentic story. <clears throat> I think from the beginning, I felt really strongly and have a ton of confidence in our brand. I'm also, I, <laughs> Sarah always laughs. Like, I guess I just like to will things to, it worked too. But all this to say, you know, my intention when we launched was to someday sell this. Yep. And um, that is changed. That's the Goldman in you. It's the Goldman in me. I know it. And um, that is that has changed. It's and you probably could appreciate this. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it. But you start to build something, you become so invested, you recognize it resonating with people and gaining traction and start making money yeah. <laughs> and you're kind of like, well, you know, and now it's kind of, it's just, it's, it's just, it's become so personal. It's hard to think about ever turning the reins over, which is another curious conversation. Maybe you'd like to hear about later in the podcast, but just being approached by, you know, different um, people who have ideas for it. Yeah. I can say from my experience in, in a good way, and I try and make it always in the positive, but your business can become a part of who you are. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, but that's like, that's what I love. Like yeah. that's the point. And Sarah and I talk a lot about, the journey and wanting to enjoy this journey. Yep. And I, I hesitate to say this because I don't want to sound like somebody that is taking this flippantly or is just has this business as a side thing. It's certainly like my dad always jokes. It's my vocation, my vacation, and my invocation. You yeah. know? <laughs> but um, but you know, Lizzie and I often kind of at critical junctures in our business have disciplined ourselves to sit down and kind of be like, you know, how are we using this business to be better people, to have avenues for to make our employees better people, to make the world a better place. And I'm not trying to be cheesy about that, yeah. Chris. You talk a lot about this. I mean, you're a people first guy too. But how are we leveraging this business to have experiences that are growing and stretching us and the people around us um, and, and making us better? And, you know, we talk a lot about that. How is it making y'all better? It's helping you learn how to work with people. You get to see the products that you sell. Yeah, and I think like the attention that we've received and the people that we've met because of it has yeah. been really like I'm so grateful for people's interest in us and for like now the people that we call friends and and their mentorship of us. 
think I've learned a ton. Um, as a, as a mom and as a wife, I feel like I have had to kind of prioritize my life in a way that um, is meaningful. Yep. Um, and I think too that being in a partnership with my sister, who is my very so best cool. friend, but also family, and recognizing the implications of that, yeah, it, it, it you know gives you a lot of. It, it's pretty. Um, I think it's pretty humbling. Totally. And I, I would also add to that. You know, I think. I've been thinking a lot lately about sort of, I feel like for so long in your life, you kind of react to things, right? It's August. And so you go back to school because that's just what you've done for 20 years. Um, But in being a little bit older and a little more, I guess I'll say secure, um, or maybe in a more steady life stage, I guess, like how am I building a life, right? And what experiences am I seeking and who am I surrounding myself with? And how am I, you know, navigating the resources that our businesses um, place sort of within my stewardship into being... Um, intention or just being intentional about that, and kind of like your conversation with was it Jeff Gates? Yeah, similar, right? Yeah. He all were both kind of talking about about that and and using your business to as a platform, sort of to build the life that that you can to make it sustainable. Um, something I've been thinking a lot about of late, but I think it sounds like maybe you have too, Chris. I have, and and I, we're we're gonna get into a lot of this in a little bit, but I, I I might now that we're just kind of here at this point of the conversation, you guys have touched on it, but like. How did growing up in the like where y'all grew up, which is in a very remote area, not a ton of people, very family centric, very Western, like how did how y'all grow up make who you are today? Because clearly, like what I'm hearing from you right now seems like a lot of this is buried deep from like how you grew up and just the way you're thinking about things. Y'all are clearly have a lot in common. So, like, let's just talk a little bit about your childhood before we tell the audience how you actually make boots. Well, I may need to enlist a little bit of help from you on this because you're a fellow West Texan. We're okay. ranch kids. You'll get this. So, Chris, what did cows eat? Hay. Okay. Yes. Grass. And, yes. And what does it take to grow hair grass? Rain. And sc- sun. Exactly. And where is it sunny 360 days a year? West Texas. <laughs> 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 Got yes. a little bit. But we laugh. You know, my our parents are ranchers and yeah. there was a huge drought in the 90s. And so growing up when we were kids at home, What's the one thing you can't do? You cannot make it rain, right? Yeah. You can do everything else and be as lean and as wily and as dynamic and as thoughtful as you can be. But at the end of the day, you can't make it rain. And that's hard <laughs> to do when you're trying to grow cattle, right? Um, yeah. And so I think we learned in, from watching my parents and the obstacles that they face in their business just about like, listen, you, you know, all the doors are closing and all the windows are closing. You, you find a new door, you find a new window or you get a chisel out, right? And you just kind of have to figure it out. And I think that so much of our attitude in our business, it probably has become really apparent in the last year, given the pandemic and all of that. But like, there's just, you just, there's never, you can't say no, right? Like at the end of the day, there's always yeah. a way to find it. Um, and I think oh, that yeah. that's been an attitude that we, that was instilled in us in a really early age. And I'm so grateful to my parents, especially for that. Um, they've also been a fantastic example of a family partnership. I mean, and you know, we don't have neighbors, like if they get in a tiff at work, they have to stay with stuff to have dinner together that night. You know, <laughs> they can't like, Rossi restaurant. I mean, I'm kidding. Obviously, it's just an hour to town, but um, they work together and then obviously live together. And so I think they've been a great example of a family partnership. And I'll um, say, you know, to kind of to that end that, um, you know, my dad always says like, bear down girls. And I, I laugh like looking back, but that's kind of, you know, a mantra now. And I, I think too that he, and I really, really appreciate this. He never gave us a pass because we were girls. And I, you mentioned, you know, Coley, our brother in between us who, we adore, um, and he's a, a fantastic person, but he like, you know, dad it, it insisted that we do everything that he expected of Coley and of the men on the ranch. And so it's spring break. It kind of stuck in college or about <laughs> going to Mexico. We had to go home to brands, you know, and in the mornings we were like, we were supposed to get up and saddle, and our, own saddle our own horses and, um, <laughs> kind of a funny story. I remember riding up with him, um, after working one morning and, he uh, took my reins and said, Liz, why don't you run in and make us a sandwich? I'll be up in a minute. And I turned around and I said, Dad, I'm either going to be a cowgirl or I'll be a cook, but I'm not going to do both. <laughs> you know? But I just, but I think that that attitude of like, doesn't matter. It, it like, then when, you know, we got ready to go off to boarding school, we took that, you know, we, we knew we could do it and go on to New York. And we were ranch kids who had got really, you know, great jobs and had cool opportunities. And I think it's just because we kind of always believed we could. So here we are now. Do you think your dad was really intentional about that or that's just his natural like way of thinking about life? I think he is kind of a still waters, run deep kind of guy. I think he's just innately really wise about people. Yep. So I think that was probably pretty intentional. 
that's pretty awesome that even like during the 90s, y'all were young enough to know that it was tough. You couldn't make it rain. Cows aren't growing. And he was able to one, instill that in you, but also kind of it's it, it's got to be hard to talk about that kind of stuff when it's not going right. Um, well, and he's taken a family business that, you know, was great and grown it. I mean, it, it, during that time, like mm-hmm. continue to buy ranches and, you know, um, raise a great herd. And um, he's known for his herd. And I think that that's it's really cool. I mean, I, I haven't met your dad, but I'm a girl dad. And it's <laughs> it's very important to me that. Uh, I do things like this. So I'm asking questions that'll help me out as well. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing a great job. <laughs> all right. So you get this going. Um, all right. So, you, but you have the idea and I'm just going to get a little deep. I'm going to get deep here. I want to like know. How, so you call your family and you're like, we're starting a boot company. You went to New York, you started meeting with designers when did you actually start putting dollars to work and like how quickly did you start designing boots? Like what was the first, how'd you make your first, you know, thousand dollars or $10,000? So we didn't make any money until after we opened the store, right? Okay. Cause we made our first thousand dollars and $10,000 by selling um, a boot. And what we hadn't, and I say this a little flippantly, of course we'd accounted for it, but it, I was reminded one day that, you know, you have to invest in inventory to have inventory to sell. Um, yeah. And so that, was a, a, a you know quickly we felt like we were in the hole um <laughs> of course we you know had budgeted and I don't mean to make it sound like we were flipping about it but, but it's yeah, true yeah. I mean you like spend a ton of money to you know, build out a store and to get you know point of sale platforms together and hire employees and then get um inventory together and suddenly you're kind of like oh gosh, before you yeah, really bring in anything right. but to your point so we um we meet with the factory they agree to make our private label so the how, way that it happened how bef- how early on is this before you actually sold your first boot like how long talk me just so, we sorry met to with interrupt. the factory it was like late yeah. summer about a, about a year sir it i think was, it was a little like yeah 14 months okay somewhere in there okay so we flew to the factory asked them if they would produce our private label meaning hey we will design boots and send you know you the plans and buy the leathers and all of that will you make what we design we produce that in your factory and they agreed to do it, which was so gracious and list it under Marin Crosby rather than Rio said Mercedes. Right. That yep. being a private label. Right. Okay. Um, and again, you know, all of our designs, all that. So we then fly to New York um, end up hiring our uh, pattern maker and designer who's a dear friend of ours. And she really starts laying things out. And from there, it got pretty technical. So from there, you know, we we come up with ideas, shoot them to Caroline, get on a call, talk for quite a bit, finesse it. She goes back, patterns it, sends me the patterns. I then translate basically from what's like a big sketch on a piece of paper and imagine, you know, boot top laid flat, right? So it's a big piece of paper, kind of the size of a poster board that's all, you know, totally detailed out. And then I take that and essentially in Excel, turn that into something that uh, like Art and Andy and the artisans of the factory can read. Um, And again, down to the gauge of the stitch, whatever the leather, obviously fabrication color, all of that is, whether it's inlay or applique, you know, just technical stuff as one does when one's producing something. And then I send that and the plans down, the leathers ordered, the leathers cut, the leathers and laid applique and all of the components are made and then they're sewn together. And then one thing that we're so proud of is that our boots are all hand lasted, mm-hmm. which is a dying, frankly, a dying art, particularly, um, you know, since it can be mechanized. And um, that means that the piece of the of leather that goes over your, over the vamp, which is where your foot goes in, is pulled across a mold of a foot by hand. Um, And the reason that that's better and more luxury is it makes for a better fit. And also each piece of, you know, it has to do too with the way the leather's cut because, you know, cows get chubby in their stomachs, not across their backs. And so you want to cut it, you know, it needs to stretch across your foot the way it would stretch across a belly, yada, yada. I can talk about this for hours. But (laughs) one of the reasons that that's so luxury is that, you know, artisans that are doing it are ascertaining that that's the right cut of the the leather and that it's going to stretch the right way. And then it's molded by hand and pulled and pulled and pulled. Um, but not so much that by a machine that it's too stretched so that your foot can mold it when it goes in and it's more technical than you care to know. But it's a huge process and one that's quite luxury and that we're quite proud of. Um, so from there, you know, all of our boots were made and we placed, I think we ordered like, it was like 587 pairs of boots total or something. And that was what we had on order when we opened, um, which is crazy. And I'll tell you that I just did a six month plan for our store in Dallas and we placed like 3,289 kind of fun. Um, but those are, as Sarah's talking, my, like my mind's going back. Those were really fun days. I mean, 
pressure is on a little bit. And like, you know, for example, my husband, who's wonderful, I made an appointment with his assistant to go up and tell him in person, like not that night when he came home over a glass of wine or, you know, whatever, but go up to his office, sit down. I think Seth was like, everything okay? <laughs> but just to say like, here's my deal. I want to sell perch to seed Marion Crosby. We're going to make luxury cowboy boots and sell them out of Helen Park Village, <laughs> you know? And then same thing with our parents. I remember my mom and dad were like, Sarah's got to finish law school and take the bar. And y'all sound like, cuckoo birds, you know, and they they are the consummate encouragers. But I think so many people were like, y'all are nuts, which we respond. You're totally right. Like we a hundred percent are (laughs) and we're and still are. But I think you don't know what you don't know. And it's kind of nice. Like when you don't know what you don't know, you you don't know if you're breaking the rules. And so you just kind of do it. And I'm not being, again, I'm not being flippant about this, Chris, like we had budgets, we had a business plan. We, we tapped every single person we could know. But at the end of the day, we were a little damn nut. Yeah. yeah. But that was fun. Like, I mean, it was like late nights in New York where we'd order like our favorite Thai food and like drink red wine and like tape like, you know, designs up on the walls. And, and oh my gosh, I know the guy at FedEx um, on, what is it? Like 20, on Canal 25th, Grand, and, yeah, or, like <laughs> he's literally my best friend. We would spend like hours and hours and hours yeah, in there. Like, and like coats with like, you know, snow pouring like in the FedEx on the floor. People were walking in like, what are these girls doing? I mean, it's just, <laughs> you look back and it was, it was, it was really really fun. And actually another story, the night before we opened, um, we went down and I don't know how we hadn't caught this because we really, we, we pushed our opening and the delivery of our boots so tightly together. Yeah, We were ready to open. We were ready, wanted to make money and we were just waiting on inventory. And I guess we got him a day or two before we set to open But the night before, no, I guess it's two nights before we went down to look through them and realized that they were ta- like one of the tags on the inside of the boot listed Rios and Mercedes and not Marion Crosby. And that was a big, big deal to us. So we hired a driver from my old company, Perch, my event decor rental company to drive overnight, take all of the boots back to Rios and have them retagged and delivered. And we literally unloaded boxes as the store was opening the day that we opened the business. But just things like that, that we felt like if this was going to be a luxury product, it needed to be high end and be exacting and perfect and up to our standards from day one. And um, yeah, we've been through some interesting experiences. But Did of the 587 boots, how many lines was that? Like how many styles? It was 12 women's styles and five men's styles. Is there anything looking back that you would have done differently now that you know and you're you're a little less yes, naive? Yes, I can answer that for sure. We had this banging style, kind of the capstone of our collection. We still have it, the Margretta. Okay. It's a tall boot. It boasts jumping stars. They're clustered on the on the counter of the boot. It's phenomenal and it's everyone's favorite. It's kind of what we're known for. Um, and when we opened, we, that first run, we did a Navy rough out with gold stars and they flew off the shelves, but we told people we'll not make this boot again. So what you have is one of eight, like, yes. uh, one of, like you would collect a piece of art, right? Yeah. right. One of eight. And I really wish we hadn't said that. <laughs> I know. Well, in fairness, we'll, we'll custom make it for you. So, you yes. know, we just didn't make it in stock. So you can't come in and buy it off the shelf. We can, you can order it and we'll make it for you for an upcharge. Um, but you, yeah, we won't do it again. And uh, that was, that was dumb. That was dumb. But also, you know, we, we, but we still, we stand by, we really want kind of our small batch of boots to, to people to feel like they're buying one of something. And so we still keep them pretty small batch. Um, and we still retire styles pretty frequently, you know, much to people's chagrin sometimes, but we think there's kind of like a beauty in that as well. Yeah. And like any fashion brand, right? Like every season looks different. And so we, we try to keep it fresh and we have some retire things, we keep, but we retire. Things, yeah. How do y'all get inspiration? And, and is the part of a fashion brand to have kind of your staples that can, you can carry with you for generations, but then be mixing in lots of new stuff. So you, have you identified what will be your staples or it's too early to kind of tell? Yeah. So we call it our core collection. Okay. Um, and we have, you know, several styles that we carry from season to season and plan to um, probably not for generations, although I'd love that, but um, for seasons, for sure, for years. Um, yep. And then from there, we try to do, um, you know, kind of a spring, summer and a fall, winter collection with specific styles in them that, again, after the end of the season, will kind of go in the vaults. Um, and then we kind of mentioned this earlier, but we have a stock program, meaning we sell boots off the shelf, come in, you leave your size 10 and a half, carry them out that day, no problem. Enjoy your boots. Or we can customize an existing boot. So you can come in and say, I really want to put my initials on the ear poles of this boot when we can you know, have that done in a matter of weeks. So you can customize an existing boot. Um, Customization is huge, I think, right oh, yeah. now. In anything, right? Um, it's just more fun to ma- if it ain't move and monogram it. Yeah. Um, but also, then we have a fully custom program where we can we take an existing style in our collection, 
you come in, you sit down, it's very high touch, very high feel, a fun experience. Mix a ranch water, sit at our design table, and you, we'll show you all the swatches we have of everything that's in our custom program. You can pick your leathers or your crock or your ostrich, pick your stitch color, and lay your initials. Um, you know, we have an amazing program. Well, I'll let Lizzie talk about that. But then we build the boot for you in five to seven months. So there's really three, you know, levels of 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 our products. Um, but also, you know, we focus so much on making it a really fun experience. Um, and I think, you know, there's been so much talk about the future of retail and the future of big box retail. And people looked at us like we were crazy to open a brick and mortar in 2017. Um, but I think that to this day, even though we have a, a really great web presence that's growing, our brick and mortar drives you know, it's, I think it's 72% of our business today, um, even in the last year, which was a crazy year. So something to think about. I don't think the experience is dead. And, you know, one of the pillars of our business is hospitality. It's really fun. So the experience, to your point, I think like, you know, retail is being kind of like differentiated by efficiency and low cost and yep. then experience in my mind, and yep. little, you know, which usually falls to the luxury brands. And so we really capitalize on that. Um, but to answer your question too, Chris, uh, you know, so so yes, we have these classic kind of core styles, as Sarah said, and then each season, we kind of have a theme around each season. And like when we opened, it was very much like our um, collection was influenced by the flora and fauna of West Texas. So stars and cactus and um, flowers and that sort of thing that grow um, in the area in which we grew up and that we kind of were inspired by. Um, last year during COVID and then all that was going on in the world, the turmoil around Black Lives Matter and that sort of thing was a lot of like love in our boots and I think like kind of like quite literally we had a booth that was like black and white with like love spelled out on it and a lot Re of regrowth kind regrowth, of rebirth yeah hope mm -hmm. and and can people they so they come in if, if you're having a custom pair done you come in how long does that process take a couple hours like am, am I gonna be pretty drunk off of ranch waters we, we before I'm so. done <laughs> <laughs> So much Therefore, easier. I'll keep doing the, That's yeah, I'll it. take that, I'll throw that it. on there. Yeah. We'll take it. You yeah. know, it can take as, as, as long a as time as you want it to. But we want you to come into our stores 490 square feet. It's pretty small. It's not yep. a heck of a lot bigger than the room in which we're sitting. Wow. Um, but you come in, it's anchored kind of by this big design table. Mix ranch water, sit down. And even if you're just buying a stock boot, we hope that you have that experience. Like sit down, visit with us if we're there, which we try to be a lot. Or with somebody on our team. Um, and then, you know, try on boots and we'll kind of start there, but it's going to take as, as long as you like, but it's, it's not, it sounds overwhelming. It's fun. I promise it's not. It's and you have like a professional boot fitter person in there. So we actually don't custom fit. Okay. Um, we just custom design. So we'll fit you to a stock last, meaning like, again, if you're a 10 and a half B, we'll get you in a 10 and a half B and then we'll make that for you. Yeah. Um, Custom fitting is amazing and such a special experience, but frankly, it adds so long to the wait time on boots. And we wanted to be able to make things more quickly and yep. kind of focus, frankly, we're up, again, kind of back to our focus on fashion. Uh, we found that, you know, our last fits 98% of our customers and not that that's good enough. Of course, we want to accommodate everybody, but we found that we just focus on kind of more on the design um, and we can, that we can be more efficient in a production standpoint. I don't want to ask you a... Um something that stumps you. I hope you know the answer. And if you don't, we can edit it. Why is a cowboy shaped the way it's shaped? Why does it have like a long heel? Like, is that so it fits in the stirrup? Oh, you're not Why does it go up the me. leg? Yeah, exactly. It has to do with the way that it fits in the, that it sits in the stirrup on a saddle. Um, and so like the heel is heavier and you want your cowboy boots to slip in the heel. Um, and that's, you know, so that, because when your foot's in the saddle, that your heel should be um, you should be at almost a 90 degree angle to the bottom of the stirrup. So you should be slanted with your heel down yep. um, and like really standing on your toes when you stand a gallop or that kind of thing. Um, and then it's tall to protect, you know, your shins and all of that from weeds, weeds and rough grass and whatever you might be riding through. Cat claw in West Texas. Rattlesnakes. I, I love it. <laughs> no, we don't make snake boots. Um, but yeah, to your point, it's all, you know, pretty intentional. Um, and even the toe shapes, I think, although they tech, there's a lot of legend around cowboy boot toe shapes. Hilarious. Um, everybody has an opinion, but a lot of people say that like the really point toe is kind of the most traditional. Um, and it has to do with kind of, I think it really varies by region. It's kind of like cowboy hats. Like yeah. we laugh. You can tell if a guy's from South Texas because he wears like the little rim cowboy hat. Yeah. And the West Texans like it, like folded up more. You know, it's a whole thing. How, um, how much time do y'all spend throughout the year? Like, already coming up with the next design. Is that the whole business? Not the whole, you know what I mean? Like are you, as soon as you get done with one, you know, season, you start yes. on the next oh, one. Yeah, and yeah. how long does that process take? So we forward and forecasting is a, is a real 
um, thing, especially in fashion. And it's so fast moving. Yep. Something I didn't realize again, coming from finance that you were going to say something. I apologize. Uh, so we're working on spring of, for next year right now. And this morning we spent two hours reviewing two new styles for spring and coloring and specking those. So how many styles will you have in spring? Will it always be five and 12 or will that continue to expand? It'll, it'll, it continues to expand. Yeah. Kind of ebbs and flows based on just how we feel um, you know, about the collection, but also, frankly, based on production capabilities. Yep. So because our boots are made entirely by hand and last hand lasted and all of that, and because we order a ton of novelty leathers, you know, tragically, God didn't make hot pink metallic <laughs> cows, although I wish he did. Um, and so, you know, a lot of it's lead time on leathers and that kind of thing. Um, we work with a ton of, you know, obviously, especially in the last year, you know, our Italian leathers were super delayed, kind of our Spanish stuff is hard to get, all of that. So really, it's just a little bit of a numbers game. Um, and, and I think that's the, sometimes it's more of an art than a science. And yeah. that, that can be frustrating um, when you're trying to hit goals and have deadlines and deliverables. Um, but it's, again, it's also kind of what's amazing about our product. And it's so cool that it's made by hand. And I think, you know, great things are worth waiting for. So yeah. double-edged sword. I was, I was talking to a friend of mine that makes custom golf clubs the other day. And I said, some of the mystique about the product is that you do have to wait for it, especially if you're doing something custom. Like if I was to do custom boots and you're like, yeah, they'll be ready next week. I'd be like, that yeah. doesn't feel very I custom. I agree. I kind of, the, the fact it takes three to six months actually adds to the prestige of the product. Well, thank you for saying that, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> I, if you're a customer you. and you don't agree with that, you should, yeah. because anything that's custom can't be made in a week, especially great boots. Um, uh, how soon, like if you're talking about the spring selection, how soon do you have to get your designs in and they need to start getting made so that they arrive? And when does spring start for y'all? March, -ish, yeah. April? Yes. We'll drop holiday before spring. Um, gosh, I mean, we're late getting spring in now. Okay. Yeah. And it varies by style. So much of it depends on the handwork. Okay, so we submit a sketch to the factory with um, an order, and then we always make a sample. So yeah. one goes through the line first, we tweak it, we recolor, we make changes, and then either from there we resample or we'll go straight to production. Um, and, you know, again, nature of the beast, even if we were everybody, you know, the guy, Art and Andy were to start on a specific boot the very day it arrived at the, at the factory, it would still take, it, you know, it takes a matter of weeks to make the boots yep. with all the various parts that happen and it has to dry in the sun and it has to be, in, you know, all of that. So um, it even the, the entire process really does take quite a bit. It doesn't take a full four months, you know, to make a pair of boots it takes a matter of weeks. Um, but so much of that wait time is because of the existing line um, at the facility and then also to source leathers and that kind of thing. Have you had any there's a lot of business owners that listen to this podcast. Do businesses ever come in and like buy a line for maybe a celebration or, yes, you know, big not deal? Yes, so or much fun. Um, so again, you know, our custom program is, is really, really cool. And we actually just did um, CBRE's top producer gift. Oh, really? Super fun. So they all have, you know, kind of carte blanche on what they want to do. And they'll come in and um, make an appointment with us and and custom, but we have done too a line of like we did um, a real estate company out of Chicago and went up for their company business party yeah. and fit everybody. But then they had their logo and um, applicate in some aspect on each person's boot. So it's neat to do that as well. It makes for a fun experience, but also a meaningful gift and one that people seem to get pretty jazzed about. I'm kind of on that train. We can talk about that after, but I, I'm we we have we've had. I'm trying to figure out a gift to give everybody that's personal. And I was going to wait and have that conversation, so we'll save that for after. But if you're listening and you've done something great in your business and you want to shower your employees with something, this is something to think about. Well, and I'll tell you one more thing that's kind of we developed, which I'm really really proud of, and I'm kind of maybe the more sentimental one between the two of us. But I love this um, portion of our custom program. So we will have people handwrite a note. Yep. That they will then transcribe onto a leather patch and then have sewn in the liner of the boot. Wow. So, for example, for Christmas, if you would know what Michael might really want, yep. we can have you, you know, and I don't know, are either of your girls writing yet? Palmer's probably not. She's getting close. Close. Okay. You know, you can or you and your girls, you know, one for each boot can write a little note that will go ahead and have the message box printed and then wrapped and then sent. And or even like, but we've done the coolest things like. Um, a couple just welcomed there, sent him from Afghanistan and had like, oh. welcome home, you know, written in, um, I think a Bible verse or something they've been praying for him, like written and then transcribed into leather, sign, you know, sewn in the liner of his welcome home boots and things like that. People have done, will you marry me? Which yeah. is a fun <laughs> one, but to your point, it's so, so, you know, with, um, Bridge, the company that we did out of Chicago, uh, the, the boss wrote like a really cool note to everybody in their boots and it was kind of. That is awesome. That's fun. I love it. It's really sweet. 
I actually for for this year, that's what I gave to Michael. Uh, it was you can have them like write and they put it on little cards that can go in your wallet. And it was that yes. same thing. And it's been like the best gift. It's I absolutely love that gift. idea. Yeah. All right. So you guys get all this stuff going. When did you sell your first boot? Like when did the cash register ring and how did that make you feel? I think we pre-sold one to mom, didn't we? Just to- <laughs> <laughs> so we we the only person that gets a discount is our brother. The yep. only mom and dad don't. No one else <laughs> friends, friends and family. She's kidding. Well, but um, up. so we opened the store on June twentieth of twenty seventeen. Yeah, um, and that was the day of our our first official sale. To your point, that wasn't our mom. Yeah. Um. But yeah, we sold our first boot that day and. You know, business was okay, and it was enough that we were encouraged. We we'd done enough math, frankly, to know that if we could sell two boots a day, five days a week for our first year, we could keep the lights on. Yep. Um, and we were able to do obviously a little bit more than that, which is nice. And then you know, our our sales have grown quite exponentially every year, for which we're so grateful. So, that, so I think that's been the hard part, right? Is so you sit there the first day, and I was like, they're going to be beating down the door. I mean, you have you get so excited about your project, you're just believing in it. <laughs> Didn't happen that way, you know. But um, <laughs> hey, but okay. somebody came. But somebody, but somebody did somebody come. Came, and, but then, but then we started to sell, and then we started to sell, and we started to sell, and then we realized, oh gosh, like if you know, it takes ninety days for a reorder of an existing boot, or you know, one hundred and twenty to sample a new one. We need to get orders in, and I think buying. So, in complete transparency, we've doubled our business year to year, year to year. Um, which is really exciting, but it's made buying really tricky. And then, yeah. you know, year three, we were hit with the pandemic and I'm really grateful. We sustained a great business through that. I'm so, so grateful for that. But it, it we did like give us pause, like sit down. Should we change what we're buying? I mean, because it's expensive. We pay up front for our boots and then turn around yeah. and sell them, you know? Um, so it's, it's been tricky not having any kind of like anything to reference yeah. and just kind of, and, and, um, um, more exciting news. We have kind of a fun announcement about um, a potential uh, or a second storefront and Ooh. trying to figure out how to buy for that is um, in a different market, in a different market with a different customer. In a, it's in a resort town too. So that's a, a trickier customer, but we're excited about it. Yeah. Why is in a resort town a trickier customer? Because they're not there as long? Sorry. Uh, I think because they're on vacation yeah, and, yeah. you know, that more yeah. they're, they're not shopping like you're kind of more serious day in and day out shopper, which is what we have in Dallas. Okay, so in a world of custom collab, all this stuff, I, do you guys get people beating down your door to collaborate and customize beyond just the customer? Yeah, like we've it, had some cool opportunities. So we did um, a really, uh, uh, Probable Grong is a big high fashion um, name out of New York City. And we did a major collaboration with him that we were really excited about and touted um, and uh, hosted him in Dallas. It, he had us up in New York. His his ten year anniversary um, runway show during Fashion Week. Um, he had his models wear our boots, which was really exciting. And we met with him beforehand, and he chose different fabrications and different silhouettes and colors and that sort of thing. It was a really eye opening experience to work with him. And then we hosted him in Dallas after the show and kind of did a mini runway um, show at the Mansion on Turtle Creek. Um, but it was fun. We had a, a big group come and. And we had like women ride in on horseback, like they do at the rodeo, you know, yeah. bearing like probable Gronk or new, Marion Crosby loves probable Gronk flags and that sort of thing. So that was, that was a major collaboration and those take a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of money. And we're really have, grateful to, that he agreed to take us on, but it might be a minute before we do another one. <laughs> <laughs> what else uh, there? Are the collaborations you want? Yeah. You know, we, we recently did something with a local artist um, in Dallas who hand painted a collection of boots and it was so successful. We're going to do it again for fall. Um, but it's a fun, it's so fun to work with other creatives because I think it gets us out of our comfort zone too. Um, especially as, you know, we think about kind of what's cool and what our customer responds to. Um, so much of it's by feel. And so it's fun to, to stretch and grow that way. Um, we love to collaborate with people. But yeah, to Lizzie's point, it's an undertaking for sure. Yep. All right. I want to talk about marketing and branding because y'all do an insane job at marketing and branding. Um, and that you started the conversation by saying it's very personal, it's very authentic, and that oozes in your brand. There's nothing like non-authentic about your brand. So how do you guys think about marketing and branding? And then I want to ask you the question of, we'll get to what happens when a celebrity wears a boot, but how does how have you thought about this? Because Instagram's on fire, your website's incredible, everything I've read and listened is so authentic. So like, what is 
driving your marketing and branding like if so and 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 answer it in a way that's like if you were teaching someone how to build a brand how would you teach them how to do it well first before we say anything we have a phenomenal marketing and and digital director um, who's become a really dear friend she's really good at her job and has taught me a lot she's also 28 i mean she's young and has great experience she worked in new york for five years um and then came to work for us what was her skill set texas she did like marketing and influencer relations um and digital um digital marketing yeah for um a fashion brand in new york two fashion brands in new york um she's we're so grateful to her she's so cute yeah she's the best um so she's taught us so much but you know we did i think I think part of it is, and probably this is a little bit of our downfall, Chris, is that so much of what we put out there is what we would want to consume. And so I think, you know, at the end of the day, if it doesn't feel like something I care to read or want to look at or think is cool, we won't put it out there. Um, And I wonder, too, if sometimes that doesn't hold us back from being, you know, a little... It's hard to put yourself in other people's shoes. For example, we're so uh, focused on the women's collection, um, probably a little bit to the detriment of the men's. And I wonder if sometimes that's just because I don't care that much about men's suits. I mean, of course I do, but you know what I mean? And so I think part of it is, but I think that speaks to the authenticity. Like if it's not something that sounds like us or that we would want to read or that's true um, because our brand is so personal and, you know, because our friends and family read about it and are involved, I think we'll get called on it really quickly too. Um, And so- try to keep it really real. Yep. I stay in your lane a little bit, but you know, there is a, we do a lot too of, of course, research on analytics and that kind of thing. And I can speak to, to that in any detail you'd like, but at speak the end of the day, it. I think there's a little bit of, it just has to be gut, right? I mean, there are all these studies that you should post this time and this many emails a week and you know, all of that. Um, and I think at some point a little bit of it's just gut. Yeah. And what feels good and what looks good. Um, you know, the other thing too is again, to our point about, giving credit where it's due. Lee's amazing. Um, and also we work with really great photographers um, who are phenomenal. And so they're giving us great, great skills to work with. We work with great stylists, great models. Um, that's all a huge part too. That having been said, we've been very intentional about choosing those people. And, you know, a lot of times we try to work with women. We'd love to work with friends um, to pay it, you know, kind of to pay it forward. And so we've built a team that we really trust, but it's really cool. It's neat. And you probably feel this way. Um, you know, all of a sudden, I'm in this position where at 30, the people that I work with are my really dear friends, but they're these amazing business people that have built really cool businesses and are like top of their fields. Um, and it's so cool to have that experience um, and to kind of grow up together and be able to leverage one another and, and build that community. It's really neat. Do um, There's a lot of famous people that have worn your boots. What happens when like your boot gets shown in a magazine or something big where a lot of people, is there a rush? And when I think about that, boots also aren't something that are just you're cranking out by the second. So like what happens when a, a huge rush comes yeah. in? You know, it's so interesting. <laughs> um, and I'll just be totally honest with you because I think it's fascinating. Magazine sales do not move. Their magazine features like when we were in Vogue or, you know, Harper's Bazaar, L or Town and Country um, or Vanity Fair really it doesn't move the needle. Interesting. Sales wise at but all. it gives we'll get you a, a ton of credibility. Yes. And it, it, so it may not move the needle sales wise, but it's interesting who takes note of you. Mm-hmm. Like all of a sudden then we, so, you know, we were featured in Vogue, Gigi Hadid wore our boots. And then all of a sudden we were on Vanity Fair's call list for boots. And then we were on Harper's Bazaar's call list for boots. And then this stylist like has, you know, who we became good friends with through that has gone on to be the New York Times editor. You kind of become relevant in that so from, from credentials yeah. and credibility, that's huge. Where we sell boots is when somebody wears them and puts them on the young Instagram. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Y'all really? Instagram. Oh, yeah. And again, this is much more Sarah's probably. Um, this sounds so silly, but like it just wasn't what I. It's much more, more relevant for your like group. Yeah. I mean, we're eight years apart, which doesn't sound. A like, lot happened in that eight years. I didn't do Instagram in college. I didn't do Instagram. I mean, yep. I, I think I got my first Instagram account for Coley's wedding or something, you know, which has been not even 10 years ago. And so, um, but it's incredible how you can leverage that platform. It's free, which of course, you know, I love. Yep. And then just the power that it has and the people who are powerful on it, I mean, hold the keys to the yep. kingdom. It is wild. And to Sarah's point, that's when the door starts flying yep. open and the phone starts ringing. But it is free marketing, leverage it. Leverage it <laughs> yes. to the core. Uh, and, yes. and figure, if you don't like it, figure it out. Like, and, 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 so and to that important. point, like Facebook too. So Facebook is not irrelevant and it's a really different crowd. Right. And and, and, and our marketing is completely different for the two different platforms, but it's relevant. What's and, different you know, about it? So 
say if we find our demographics and again, um, are on Facebook or maybe a little bit, a little bit older and a little more conservative. Okay. And then on Instagram, the, our demographics are younger, way more female and frankly, a little like sexier. Yep. A little cool. edgier. Yeah. So you just have two different ways that you talk to each audience, Correct. even though they're owned by the same company. Interesting. It's do you do any that. paid ads or it's all yeah. organic? All organic. We have. So I think in our first year, we did a big trunk show in Houston and we like did a paid ad to to market that. To um, market that was the, targeted. the trunk show traffic, but not to market our... But yeah, yeah, nothing. Uh, we, we don't do anything paid right now. Do bloggers do the like to know it with y'all's stuff? So How we, does that work? Um, that So it's interesting. You have to be... It's a reciprocity thing. So you have to... We would have to work um, beyond like to know it to be like for them to make commission um, on our boots. And we haven't yet done that. And that's a great platform, uh, yeah. 100% on, on the list. Um, we're just a young enough brand that we kind of haven't uh, quite gotten there yet. We haven't signed up. And you said 72% of boot sales come from in-store, not online. Okay. Mm-hmm. But that's changing and growing. And we really saw that happen. I know this wouldn't surprise you during um, the pandemic. So what changed? Or, or oh, people I, more... I, think, I think people were... were, were at home, yeah. shopping online, yeah. and were more willing to treat themselves. They had to cancel their vacation that year. They got refund on tuition, yeah. you know, and they they had a little more ex- expendable income. And and we we did a lot of like, um, we we may have, you know, gotten on Facetime or done some kind of virtual appointments for them, but um, our our online sales, I mean, I I think went up by like fifteen percent or something. I do think too um, that maybe coincided with some great national press. Um, and so we found again, you know, in our kind of web analytics that we had different pockets of customers from kind of different areas too in that time. Um, which You're right. it wasn't just growth in Dallas, like people that weren't leaving their house. It was people that were finding out about us and, and, and it's been helpful boots. because we've used that in deciding where to place the second store, our web demographics from our online sales. That's how really you decided in, where to go. No, but it helped influence it. So how are you going to do you, how do you for, how, more specifically, we have great, great pockets. I didn't mean to interrupt you yeah, just, no. just to, to, to expand on that. So it doesn't sound confusing, but like we have great, great pockets in New York and LA. Yeah. Atlanta is strong for us. Kind of throughout the South, you'd be surprised like Birmingham's a banging market for us. Nashville, Memphis. that's not surprising. Um, and then we get like Seattle, like what? I don't know. Really? But, and then kind of like th- throughout Florida, San Diego, I mean, sorry, California, like the West Coast, we have a great little pocket. Anyways, all this to say- We have a really good little Connecticut gal. A good Connecticut gal, which is, is fun. Um, but all this to say, when, then when we started kind of thinking about where these people traveled and vacationed and watched, like even like, I mean, I went so far as to like look at flight patterns, like where where direct flights go to from these locations and um, kind of pointed to one place. I've got some ideas in my head. Which our PR will announce. I think they're wanting us not when to say When are we much. announcing? <laughs> This fall. Okay, great. Yes. And is that how you think about growth? More really super high touch niche retail locations in these cities? Or is it online? Or what's growth looks like to y'all? I think that's changed a lot too since we opened, you know, which is interesting because we've only been open four years. And I think my theory on a lot has changed. But, you know, originally it's that we thought that maybe wholesale would be the right expansion route for us. Um, Because our product is handmade and domestically produced. We really don't have the margins for wholesale that yeah. we'd like to. And um, so direct to consumer makes sense. Um, another storefront is a, is a huge undertaking. And yeah. because our standards are so high, both with our product and the way that we're, our customers are treated and the experience that they have, you know, staffing that and having the inventory for it, which again is, is worrisome as it's handmade and takes a long time to get. And we're ordering more and more and more. Um, but we just decided that a second storefront made the most sense. And yes, I mean, high-end, luxury experience retail is really where we want to sit. Yeah. Yep. How does uh, how has COVID impacted supply chain or sourcing material? Has it been tough for this industry? We've been, we were really lucky in that we are domestically produced. Yeah. And so our factory was able to, on a schedule distance, basically stay open. Um, and half our students would come in, you know, in the morning and half would come in later in the afternoon and everybody was distanced, but it was able to more or less stay open, which was huge. Um, and although the production slowed, of course, yeah, of course, um, the factory was able to stay open, although did production did, of course, slow, um, as it needed to. And we were really lucky because we were geared up for a really big spring. So we placed a ton of huge leather orders. So we had a bunch of leather and then luckily our cousin Jody, who handles our production, um, had gone through and, and it just so happened to have placed a bunch of orders for things like our lemon wood pegs and our steel shanks and, you know, extra lining leather and all of that stuff. So it was, it was in our hands. Um, and so we didn't have as much of an issue, um, sourcing some of that, 
what we did have a hard time sourcing was our specialty, like fun leathers, especially I mentioned earlier, but anything out of Spain or Italy was, I mean, we're still, we still don't have it. Um, but we were really lucky in that. And again, it was just a timing thing. We geared up for a huge spring and it, it worked in our favor. Are y'all, um, are a lot of y'all's customers first time boot wearers or do the majority of people already, they've had boots and now they're just. No, you'd be surprised when I love that too. I think yeah. that that honestly, that's really like validating, right? Someone yep. comes in and they, cowboy boots were never on the radar and now they are. Um, pretty cute. We had like, and then people like hear about us randomly and like want to come and they visit Dallas. We had this couple recently come in the store from Connecticut and we had a boot jack out, you know, so you can take your boots off. You know, like, you know what a boot jack is. You like stick your heel and, you know, you put a foot on oh, yes. one side and you stick your heel on the other and it helps you pull, um, you know, pull your boot. It's a way to pull your boots off without having another human have to do yeah. it. A little more elegant experience, but they're called a boot jack. Right. And they were so cute. They wanted it. Um, and I thought that was kind of funny. Like they didn't even own a pair of cowboy boots, although they left with a pair that day. And I thought, okay. And they thought it was um, to put wine in. <laughs> 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 so anyways, all this to say, we do have some uh, some people who are new to the to the um, category. But yes, and even, even in Dallas, you know, kind of the high fashion girl has not really thought about much about cowboy boots, even to go to the rodeo or to a, a on a ranch weekend. And, and now they're coming in and buying them. As of, are a lot of people from like? Do you see a lot of folks even in Fort Worth for the Fort Worth Rodeo? And yes, yeah. and that's so much fun. We call we call it seeing them in the wild. It's so much fun. Oh, you, but people come by for the rodeo too. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, by. yeah. I'm sorry. I thought you meant you. I see them at the Fort Worth Rodeo. Yeah. So y'all are going to do 3,200 boots in the spring or next year? So that was for our my six month buy for next January through June. Yep. For Dallas, and that will be just our stock program. Yeah. Of which customs is not included. So people come in and do customs and custom makes up 40% of our business probably. Yeah, closer to 30, but yeah. Wow. 30. Does, un business. does uncle make customs too at scale? Well. So are you, are you is he so, like, hey guys, I said so, I'd make some for you and now you're like making tons of custom boots. Well, so what we did to kind of find compromise with him was we said, okay, how about this? You can only custom what's existing in our program, an existing style, an existing sil silhouette. People can change the colors and fabrications of it and add an initial in a meaningful way and a message box that they'd like or a branch brand or whatever it might be. And we felt like that allowed them to really make it their own, but they were playing inside a sandbox. You yep. know, it's kind of like when you go get frozen yogurt and it all looks so good. All the, the do your own toppings look so good that you put too many <laughs> toppings on it and then they taste gross. Does that ever happen to you and yeah. your yogurt tastes bad? Yeah. Custom boots are like that. I can tell you I've done it multiple times in my life. <laughs> um, and so we felt like if we could curate a program that was really special and really tailored, but still allowed for a ton of individual expression, um, that that was really the sweet spot. So that's kind of where we where we came to the agreement. So that did two things for us. It allowed us to agree, uh, you know, have trainer agree to produce custom boots for us, but it also allowed us to ensure we feel like the aesthetic of our boot is going to be beautiful, however people choose to make it their own. So... In a world of uh, custom everything, custom boots, one, are an incredible gift. You can wear them forever. They're awesome looking. But I'm just really curious, what is like a story of somebody that's come in and customized boots in a way that's like, wow, I never really thought that people would do this? Okay. Um, well, I'm just going to make it, to take it back to, the, no one came in. This was this was my experience. So okay. two things. One is, and this is actually really fun, but um, this morning I was up at 5 a.m. Uh -huh. because my husband's cousin jumped pole vault in the Olympics and won the gold medal. Wow. And it was insane. Nice. But um, we're really close <laughs> to them and they're an amazing family. Mondo is his name. Mondo Duplantis, he jumped for Sweden. His mother's Swedish. So he, he, um, jump for Sweden, although he's from Louisiana and lives in the States. But Seth was like, we've got to send him boots. Like, that's so much fun. And so I put an order in with Sarah this afternoon. We're going to do, um, I mean, it's the Olympics. It's a gold yeah. medal. Gold top boots. Don't you think you have to? That's awesome. The Vamps will be brown. So when he wears jeans and stuff over them, which he will... Um, but they have like, you know, number one on them. And then we wrote a really sweet message um, on the inside for him. So that's kind of fun. And then also um, I had my, I celebrated my 10 year anniversary um, a, about a year and a half ago during, I guess just a year ago. Was that just a year ago? Um, and I really wanted to go to Vegas to renew my vows. <laughs> and Which, uh, if you know, Lizzie is very on brand. <laughs> uh -huh, I, lo I love you in Vegas uh, with a big group of friends that we couldn't go because of the pandemic. But I had powder blue 
um, boots made to match um, the powder blue velvet um, pews in the church where I'm so excited to the little chapel where Elvis was going to make sure that Seth and I were in it to win it. But it was kind of fun. So are you still going to get renewed maybe for your 11th anniversary? I, I have to. I've always wanted, I really want to get married in Vegas. My mom put the kibosh on it. So we have to renew our vows at some point. I love it. Yeah. You've started a fashion brand. You're now four years in. If if somebody's listening, what are the things that you're not naive about anymore that are like, we're four years in, now we've learned all this stuff that you would get, if somebody was asking for advice on how to start something like this, what would you tell them? Um, Be crazy. Uh, you, like okay. lean into it. All right. Yes. So I think Sarah and I very, very much hold to the mantra that it can be done. Like, yep. and you just make it work. Like, and I think, again, it just kind of, you just got to have some grit. You got to bear down and kind of, and kind of make it work. We work so hard. And yeah. I think that that's, uh, it's not, it's not lost on me that of course this was going to take some work or it wasn't lost on me that of course this was going to take some work. But I mean, this is just like something that, I mean, the burdens of the day, whether you have a disappointed customer or an invoice came in and you're, you know, worried uh, right now. I mean, we're, we're, maintaining our Dallas store while getting ready to open this new one. And it costs a lot of money and it, trying to kind of like figure all that out is, it, it, you know, takes energy. And um, I, I think, I think it's so personal and it affects you so greatly um, financially. And I think emotionally, and again, like in your partnership, I think recognizing just um, how much work it would be and um, the burdens that surround it. I, I wish, I think maybe had I been more prepared for that, it wouldn't be so, it wouldn't have been so overwhelming from the get-go. Of course, when it's successful, it's going to be probably. Yeah. So it comes with that. But, um, and I'm, I'm happy to work. I'm, I'm a hard worker, but this is just, it kind of, you don't turn it off. Oh, yeah. Do you have anything you would add? Yeah. Maybe more from the fashion perspective. Like what things have you learned about fashion, new things that maybe you didn't know right out the gate? You know, it's interesting, Chris. I think that, fashion sort of has this stereotype of being, you know, it's all about what's cool and what's now and what's relevant. But it's funny, you always kind of feel this pressure to do things in a similar way to other people, not necessarily aesthetically, but like we felt a lot of pressure to like be on a fashion calendar and have boots drop, you know, in February and in June. And that's when the major department stores get new collections in and all of that kind of stuff. But I think it's really cool to just do your own thing. And I think that as we've gotten a little kind of more confident in the collection, you know, I used to even kind of hesitate with with saying, you know, we're a fashion brand. And 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 I think I felt like because maybe we weren't in New York or because we were a smaller brand that we didn't have a seat at the table. And I think I've gotten past that. Um, like just be confident and 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 focus on the product. And it's so cheesy. Everybody says it, focus on the product and the rest will come, but it's true. Um, and I think don't be afraid to kind of do things your way. And again, like break the rules. I love it. I literally just wrote our mid-year letter to the team, and I said in the letter, for so many years, I spent so much time watching everybody else and trying to be everybody else, and you know they do it this way, we need to do it this way. And like it was the first time I wrote to the team, which is pretty much what you just said, is like, no, I'm now more comfortable going like we do it our way. And that's what's going to make us successful than trying to be everybody else, because that's where it does get overwhelming and kind of like it gets like it's not fulfilling and you're chasing and it's like, OK, but there are so many things about their situation that we don't have. And so trying to be them is you're just fighting this it's like it's, it's like in quicksand. As soon as we leaned into like, nope, we're who we are. We do it our way. We're going to make tons of mistakes. It puts a lot of pressure off. It does. And then it just starts working. Oh, I know. And you're so right too. Like it does. Our one of my mantras, and I'll say it again and again, is like get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yep. But get in the right uncomfortable. Yep. You know what I mean? Don't be looking left and right and being un, you know, don't be nervous to, to your point. Like you're not doing what other people are, but get in your uncomfortable because that's where the magic happens. Yeah. What else do you say? I love it. You always say um about the health and the change and the oh, oh. <laughs> uh it's an old adage but healthy things grow growing things change and change is good yeah um, and i struggle with that like i'll dread any kind of change for so long after even after it happens it's very hard for me that's um, your point chris like recognizing why are we doing it this way we keep right. like do it like to change it yep. you know um and yeah. take that feedback it particularly is. from your employees they'll have good feedback take it yep. and change <laughs> how many employees do y'all have there's five of us including sarah and me i love it full-time and then we have some great contractors as well 
All right. I have a, a personal question to ask. Okay. You're about to have your fifth child. I married a cute boy. You did marry a cute boy. And I have so much respect for mother entrepreneurs because even during COVID, like having to be at home for a few days, even with kids running around, I was like, oh my gosh, I do not know how women do this. It was my first like real, how the hell do you do it? It Ask Sarah, it, I mean, even getting in the car to come over here, it's just like, it, it's a struggle every day. But that's it's a it. huge inspiration. Well, you're sweet. I appreciate it. Here, here's the oh, deal. Moms are superheroes. Oh, I'm are. so with you. It blows oh, my are. mind. And five is a little, maybe more than we thought we were going to have that we're really excited about. We also really always wanted a ruckus, big, chaotic family. That was just kind of our vibe. And this <laughs> is kind of who we are. And, and we love the idea of like our house being at it is the Grand Central Station. And, and I'm sure you're, you're surprised to hear that we're a little loud, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but all this to say, so, so I recognize this is what I signed up for, you know, and at the end of the day, People say this, but I think it's so true. I love that my kids, it's it's so fun. Sarah, June, my my seven-year-old, who's my oldest, will say things like, mommy, it's so cool you're a boss. I told people today that you're a boss. And like what, you know, and, and talks about the the boot store with them. But one of, in my entire career with Miriam Crosby, which is, you know, going on five years now, maybe my most meaningful moment was when um, we flew down to the ranch for a photo shoot um, with Vogue. And I took Jean out of school to go with me. And I think that, she, I mean, her, her, her teacher called me and was like, June says she's going on a photo shoot with Vogue. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, no, she really is. But, and then the magazine came out, we got to see pictures. She wasn't in it, but, you know, of Sarah and me in it. And um, it, I, I don't know. I just, it's really, really cool to impart in your children the value of hard work, the value of enjoying your work. And I think to me, measure success with, People measure it differently. Money, prestige, expansion. I don't know. But to me, it's, I think that I measure my success by how fulfilled I am in my business. And that sounds so cheesy, but I mean it so wholeheartedly. The people I've met along the way and the experience that I'm getting to have and taking my kids along for the ride is the best part. And I think, you know, my husband's also an entrepreneur. He's extremely supportive and encouraging and really stinking helpful. Yeah. Um, and I think building something, you know, he's building his own business. I am too, but we're building it together and then doing it along with our family. It's um kind of, it's just, it just fills my heart. That's so awesome. So your dad's was like, bear down. Do you have like a mantra for your kids or something that if yeah. they're on the podcast in 20 <laughs> yeah, years, actually, I'm going to ask him like, what did your mother do for you? Well, so it's actually, it's uh, every morning when he leaves, he asks them, guys, what are you going to do today? And they say, um, we're going to listen well, we're going to make a new friend, and we're going to do better than yesterday. And we just celebrated Seth's 40th birthday party or birthday with a big party. And we had that printed on um, the napkins. And I just think it's great. Like whether you're four or you're 84, like, you know, you like listen well, you make a new friend, you do better than yesterday. I, I think that kind of sums it up. I love it. All right. A couple more personal ones and we'll, we'll bring it home. But uh, what uh we we've kind we've kind of talked about a couple of them and it's been personal throughout it but do y'all have a morning routine so for me covid i'd never had a morning routine i like jumped out of bed and just got to work do you guys have something that, like get you going get you in the mood mm-hmm. um I'm, I'm an early riser i okay. need to be i need to be up to before my children are because if i am reacting it's never good i kind of need to be like on the other side of it yeah. you know and, but I like to kind of get my ducks in a row, understand my day, get through my calendar, have a little quiet time. And then, um, I get them fed and usually take, um, some of them to school or to an activity. And then I'm, I'm a runner. So I, um, I, I really find that I'm like reflective on a run or I can work through a problem on a run, kind of just, um, release some stress or some tension. So I make that a priority. And then, um, I shower and usually, We'll pick up coffee for Sarah or, or we'll meet for a tea somewhere in the village and then um, or I'm in the office. Same. So, um, or similar, I guess, minus the kid part. Uh, <laughs> my alarm goes off at 630. I'm out of bed by 645. I usually have a cup of tea and like cruise through my emails because I can't, I can't stand not just looking at them, you know? Yeah. Cruise through my emails. Sometimes I call my mom um, or my parents to try to check in and check in with them. Then I head out for a run, um, come back in. And then, uh, yeah, pick up, I kind of, you know, dress and do, I try to do some things around my house in the morning. That sounds silly, but like, I like to come home to a clean house. So I know like my dishwasher is empty and that's a silly discipline, but, um, one that I've had for a long time. And then, yeah, I usually meet Lizzie and then head in the office, um, then nine or 10 till five, six, seven. And yeah, that's my morning. 
trying to get better too about um, on my runs, like listening to a podcast or um, I feel like I'm always kind of inspired by people you've interviewed and um, yeah. Podcasts yeah. are really, a really cool medium for sure. They're, awesome. They're just a little like nice tidbit. And, and to your point, you know, you can listen to him for 15 minutes on the way to work in a way that, you know, it's, you learn something new and take something with you. I think I also, I also always listen to the wall street journal in the morning, just a okay. quick like AM edition. Yeah. I feel like, again, it's just nice to have a snap of like what's going on in the world and um, be somewhat relevant. And I think too, that, you know, it sounds so silly, but pretty easy for me to get bogged down in like boots and leather colors and lucky charm cereal. So <laughs> keeping like myself relevant and somewhat interesting and trying to kind of have talking points that are beyond you know what, what about stroller you? to buy <laughs> what do about I you? Have what's one? your morning routine chrissy poo so i usually <laughs> chrissy poo will wake up uh i try and wake up at six and i go on a morning walk or i play tennis i play tennis now but i try and work out and get home by about 7 seven thirty when the kids are starting to wake up um the walk is huge for me i will probably walk three or four days a week similar to what you said it's just me, my thoughts. I'm by myself walking around the streets. So is that a new discipline since COVID? It is. Okay. Yeah, Do you think too? Part of it's just getting outside. It gets it me nuts when I'm not outside. It is. And I used to come in the office with all this stuff on my mind. And I think I would like dump it on the people. Not bad stuff necessarily, but just I'd come in hot. And that just gives you time to kind of like smooth it out and figure out just kind of through osmosis. And what I found was like, the reason I asked this question on the podcast, a lot of, I call it really successful people have a morning routine. Like they have something they do in the morning that gets the day going. Um, and it's really changed everything, how I think about the day and set the day up. So I just think it's really important. Um, and what you said about the podcast, I think audio is, you know, I have a podcast, but I think audio is huge. I could tell you you know, you could tell your kid on paper, you could write down like, I love you. They'll take that one way, but you can say it to them. When people listen to this podcast, they're going to hear the inflections in your voice. There's just so much you get through audio and podcasts that I think it's it's huge. And um, have you all ever gotten in a fight? Oh, yeah, for sure. But so, um, but we actually, we aren't. Sorry, I just kind of. No, I, no I, I laugh. The reason we hesitate is because, so, so um, I'm not a big, oh, not that, trust me, like, you know. I don't have perfect relationships and I don't have the perfect marriage and that kind of thing, but it really makes me uncomfortable to fight. I'm also a big communicator. Like if something's bothering me or I'm like sensitive to something, I'll talk about it. That's huge. So I feel like we, uh, we talk it out, Sarah, uh, and rightfully so can get a little tiffy with me about things sometimes. <laughs> uh, I'm the grumpy also, one. We, we spend so much time together. Now we just know how to deal with it. Like I, I know when she's like in a mood, she just needs a minute. She knows that when I'm upset, we are going to have to talk it out. Like, yeah. you know, and so we really do have pretty good. I'm trying to think of like a major, and our fights are really stupid. <laughs> um, so this is hilarious. Actually, this is a great example because it's really, uh, it will color our personality as well. But Lizzie refuses to get TSA pre check. Chris, <laughs> it has taken years off my life. I'm t- like every time. birthday, every Christmas, I'm like, will you just do the TSA pre check application? That is all I want. It'll take you 15 minutes and then go to your interview. And I promise you, I will be on the, like, it would just <laughs> truly make my entire life. Guess what she finally did two weeks ago? Yeah, she did it. Free. She did it. But I but booked like, our tickets and not list Sarah's TSA pre, and it was just. Ooh. I'm telling you, I just that Ooh. that's like that was a, that's always a fight a little bit. Um, but we actually had a really hard time naming our business, which is funny. That was when it, professionally, that's the biggest fight we've ever had. Our biggest disagreement. Okay, well, let's talk about it. We're not going to just let that one slide. No, it, you know it, what does Mir and Crosby mean? I know, but what does it mean? Oh, have you read that on the website? Oh yeah, Chrissy Who? I, I did some. <laughs> freaking due so, diligence. Thank you. So Mirren is um, a nickname, sort of a take on our great grandfather's first name. Okay. And he was kind of a really debonair cowboy, but more importantly, he and his wife were really instrumental um, in my father's life. So my great grandfather for whom the business is named passed away when my dad was like 10 ish, I think. And then my dad's own father passed away right after he graduated from TCU. So he had plans to move to Dallas and work for a bank and immediately had to go home and run the ranch. And his grandmother, who Lizzie is named, or yeah, who's Lizzie is named for, so Mirren's wife, um, was really his business partner. And she had a third grade education and was just a, you know, this woman from Midland who married a rancher and figured it out. But she had great people sense and great business sense. Um, and he credits so much of his kind of business acumen to her. And so we love the nod to that couple. Um, and again, Lizzie's name for for her, which is really cool. 
Um, and then it's also another word for myrrh. And we kind of like the bib- biblical implications of this being like a gift, God. And then Crosby is a pasture on our family's cattle ranch, but also a street in New York we both lived on. So we love the synergy of like New York meets the ranch. And pasture, not pastor. Yeah. Like it's confusing. So what could it have been? What was the argument over? I don't even remember now, Sarah. And I don't remember fighting about it. So see, we'll have to fight about whether or not we fought about it. Y'all can fight about that on the way home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> um, it was something like, uh, we liked the word Tula. I don't know. It got kind of weird there for a minute. Weird. It's hard. It's really hard. Coming up with a name was really hard. Do you have somebody in the industry, in the fashion industry that y'all look up to? Oh, definitely. Like maybe somebody, people that you work with today, but is there like a you know, somebody out there that gives you inspiration or is that what makes fashion people uh, special is that they draw their own inspiration? You know, it's interesting. I think one of the lessons I've learned from Lizzie, of which there have been a ton, is Lizzie uh, will lev- like does a really good job of leveraging connections and asking for advice and developing mentors. I think you do. Um, and you always kind of say like, pick up the phone, call the people you know, start there, right? Yeah. Um, start with your network, leverage that, and then kind of go from there. And you do the, the very best job of that. Anybody I know, Lizzie, you really do. Um, so I think, you know, early on, she encouraged me to call all of my fashion contacts in New York and just be honest with them and be like, Hey, and again, not like, Hey, can I pick your brain? Let me take you to coffee, but have a specific ask. So I called my bunch, all my old bosses in New York and, you know, friends, even that freelance and everybody I could think of people that worked in retail and, you know, asked them a question. I'd be like, Hey, I'm going to send you this boot rendering, a a flat sketch. Tell me what you think. Do you like it higher? Do you like it lower? What do you think about it? Maybe something specific. Um, and we've been so lucky in that people, I think, have responded to that. And we have great friends and mentors um, in a lot of ways. But no, Chris, and, and nobody's an island, right? Like you you would never get here alone. Um, but I think part of it's it's having the courage to ask, but also asking something distinct and specific. So I'm still learning. My fashion designer, Sarah, is the one with a fashion background. And I have, have not always been into fashion. Um, but I have you know, people whose um, businesses I really would love to emulate or whose business savvy, I think, is incredible. So my old boss, Chase Coleman, <laughs> is um, someone who I, I, I've learned a ton from working under him. And then He's clearly not very dumb, that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but also, so this is hilarious. I love Mark Cuban. I think he's like, he talk about someone with some grit. Yeah. Um, and so I <laughs> just decided he was going to be my friend. And it's hilarious. Sarah teases me that um, Mark Cuban's my unpaid life coach. Yeah. Because if you email him, he he answers. He kind of like prides himself on like on answering people. So I email him all the time. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> yeah. No, honestly, we need to just throw in the towel and go get a margarita. I feel like we'd be friends. But he's awesome. He's been super helpful. And he's like, and it'll be funny. Like I'll be struggling with something at 11 and just shoot a quick note. And he'll write back like a three sentence answer. And I'm like, that's yes, that's incredible. So. What's his email address? I'll get to you. I'm going to get it. I'll I'm going to send him an email. Tonight. Tonight. Everybody on the pod. I, 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 and he, yeah. I love that about him, though. Like he, That's awesome. He doesn't mind um, paying it forward in a way. Paying it forward. And like he's, I, I, he, I listen to him speak at things. And in fact, a couple of things I've been to have been kind of like women's, women entrepreneurial conferences. And I really admire his like um, enthusiasm for women starting businesses. And he's invested in quite a few. And um, anyways, yeah, I think he's fantastic. That's awesome. All right. We talked about growth. We talked about opening up a second location. We talked about in stores. We talked about online, but you also said you're a fashion brand. Will there ever be anything besides boots? You are so wise. Um, Yes, there will be. We are working hard on another category now. Um, it hoping hats? that it'll launch for holiday. It's not hats. Okay. No, we're hoping it'll launch in our new location. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that we don't know about. We're we teasing about. real hard today. Oh, I apologize. I know that's kind of a whip. Uh, um, but yes, we are working on another category. And you know, it's funny in thinking through, you always thinking about these things, right? Like through product um, differentiation. And um, we we kind of landed on something that is a little bit of a stretch for us. And it's been so fun to learn something new and grow and get really excited about that. But um, to the point where like, even the packaging is quite foreign to me. So we're learning a lot. It's been a, a fun, a fun project. I love it. All right. How can people find y'all? Where can they go to, uh, to look at what y'all have done? Like, it's pretty awesome. Thank you. So- uh, the website's a great place to start. We're at www.mirincrosby.com. Um, and then, of course, on Facebook and Instagram at Mirren Crosby. You're or, also, we also have a Twitter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We tweet. And you're also welcome to email us at info at Usually Sarah or I check that. 
happy to get back to you. Or comes, yes, in Highland Park Village. Yes, we'll have a ranch water. I love it. Thank you so much. Chris, thank you. This was an honor. I appreciate it. It was great.